It is my privilege and honor for me to uh, invite the first lecturer, Professor Luc Montagnier, uh, with the talk, uh, Water Structure Carrying DNA Information from Pathogens. And uh, I would like, uh, I don't need uh, to speak a lot about Professor Luc Montagnier. He uh, attended this conference uh, already many, many times, and uh, I think everybody know uh, this uh, Nobel Prize uh, winner, uh, whom uh, we all have the honor uh, to uh, see here. Uh, I would like only just to add a couple of words to what Jerry said about French science. Uh, from my point of view, and I believe that I'm not alone, uh, it seems to me that Professor Luc Montagnier is in the same row of great uh, French scientists like Lamarck, Benveniste, and Luc Montagnier. And all these three people, uh, uh, they have a great impact, had a great impact on the development uh, of science. Like ideas of Lamarck, uh, they uh, begin to be acknowledged 200 years after his death, but they are already completely acknowledged. Uh, and I hope very much that it will take much less time uh, that ideas of Professor Luc Montagnier will be acknowledged by the whole scientific community. Uh, please, uh, uh, Professor Luc Montagnier. Good morning. I think uh, at this uh, new meeting, which now uh, occurs every year, I will uh, talk about re recent results which try to simplify uh, the problem. You know, there are many problems raised by the water transmission of information about your memory and so on. And uh, I choose actually to look s simply at nature, especially in the world of microbes which are surrounding us, sometimes for good, sometimes for bad. And uh, I will show you that those microorganisms have invented water memory, water transmission of information before us. And I think the nature gives us very good example, provided we have an open mind. And I think uh, people working uh, in this field have to have a very open mind because we are exploring new fields which uh, sometimes uh, are uh, against the dominating uh, minds. And I think in, in the, in the, uh, at the end, we will win. I'm not sure, I'm sure we will win because we are closer to the true, to nature. Okay, thank you. If I could have the first slide, please. So, of course, we are uh, in a complicated world. Humanity has made many progresses, is, even in terms of number, and also increase of the well-being for most of them. But uh, we are facing new problems, just raised by our own activities, like food production, which is now industrialized, chemical pollution, electromagnetic pollution. We are surrounded by waves for communications. I think it's a, it's a new event which did not exist uh, before the 20th century. And again, also the climate warming, which uh, everybody knows, but it will also change, it will be also change our own system, our own ecosystem, especially with the parasites which are surrounding us. 
The impact on our health is important. Immune deficiency, reproduction, new epidemics, chronic disease. I will insist especially today on the chronic diseases which are uh, increasing all the, in all countries and uh, whatever the level of development. And this leads to many important diseases which are listed here. And I'd like to stress the importance of neurodegenerative diseases, Alzheimer, Parkinson, autism in young people, arthritic disease, cardiovascular disease, and vector borne. So this is going to increase also because of the warming of the climate. So I choose to first to illustrate the research in this domain on Lyme disease, which is uh, caused by mostly uh, microbes, bacterium, Borrelia burgdorferi, which have a polymorphism, neurological tropism, induce oxidative stress, but also persist for many years, and this is, has been controversial for a long time, but I think the evidence now is uh, almost 100% that there are chronic phases of this infection. The Borrelia has found ways to persist in the body for a long time and cause uh, especially neurological disease. I'd like to show you just one example which has been studied in our laboratory showing that one person was hit by a, a, a tick in 2003 and had only neurological sign later, 10 years later, and joint inflammation. It was treated by antibiotic and improved, but not completely cured. But uh, the evidence of persistence of uh, the germ was brought about by molecular techniques like PCR, polymerase chain reaction. And there are many examples like this. So the, indeed, even the the meeting with the insect is, of course, very important. Some people do not really realize that it could lead to a very grave disease later in their life. And it's not excluded that some new ways of transmission can occur, like the, if the pregnant woman is infected, it could transmit the infection to her child after birth, or at the time of birth. I'd like also to stress that this is a very complex system, that in fact the mitochondria of the salivary gland of the tick is infected with another bacterium, a small bacterium, a rickettsia. Medichloria mitochondria has been called by the uh, Italian uh, finders of this infection, which could also play a role in the disease. And there is also a, a worm which could uh, hide uh, also in, 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 the, in the tick and this worm also may contribute to perhaps the aggressivity of the tick for biting. So this is a complex disease and there are also co-infection with other bacteria transmitted by the tick at the same time than Borrelia. But I like to stress that the explanation how to persist or the germ to persist in, in for many years is still an open question. We study first this uh, P. 
persistency with classical PCR, which you show a model here in which the TAC polymerase are thermophilic, thermoresistant uh, enzyme polymerase, DNA polymerase, can work many times after the opening of the double helix of some DNAs. And we are specially designed, uh, like others, some primers to recognize some part of the 16S ribosomal DNA. Actually, the genomic information of the, parasite, of the bacterium is also complicated by the fact that there are several plasmid DNA, plasmidic DNAs, which are circular DNA carrying some genetic information on top of the chromosomal DNA of the bacterium. But we choose uh, the 16S ribosomal DNA because it's present in all, in all subspecies of the, of the bacterium and does not vary as well as the plasmid DNA. So in this uh, ribosomal part, there is are some conserved regions which are common to several species of Borrelia, but also some variable regions which we can uh, sequence and which will help us to specify the nature of the infecting germ in the, in the patient. So this PCR DNA is recognized for Burgdorferi, but also Garini, Afsilia Valesiana, and maybe some others as well. Just to show you that we choose finally the primers for a small part of this DNA on 499 base pair, which are put, uh, pose, put there in a, in a green part. Uh, this slide is showing the high secondary structure of the ribosomal RNA, which is uh, 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 produced by this DNA. Sorry, hang on, that's the wrong way. Okay, so this is the first part of our work, which is really classical, but the problem is we found the specific DNA bound by electrophoresis only in a minority of patients. So really the question was, is there only form, only other forms of DNA or which could carry the DNA information uh, we cannot detect by this classical PCR. So this is where water comes. And I'd like to show you with the collaboration of Giuseppe Vitiello here, Claude Lavallee, my main collaborator, uh, that uh, we could detect in many patients some information of Borrelia DNA, which is not DNA itself. So we started by making dilutions, one in 10 each time, and uh, this indicates that at the beginning we are still dealing with the DNA from uh, the bacterium but in higher dilution on the right, there is no, no molecule left, only water or impurities of water. So we use filtration and uh, we have done a lot of controlled experiments using the prototype strain of Borrelia from ATCC and using two nanograms per mil of DNA, so very low concentration at the beginning. And we were stimulated by our collaboration with Giuseppe Vitiello. Uh, Giuseppe will tell you in more details 
this work which mostly imply that quantic physics, quantum field physics, intervene in this uh, research. And uh, this is a uh, drawing made, uh, published in this paper, published last year, indicating that between the double helix of DNA on the left and the enzyme on the right, there is a medium, intermediate medium, which is water. And this water is organized is as the, some kind of a common activation which form a coherent domain and this coherent domain, domain will transmit an image of electromagnetic image of DNA to the enzymes. So this is uh, actually uh, postulated for a general mechanism of PCR, of polymerase chain reaction. He will explain why they, uh, by using some very small primers, oligonucleotide of about 20 base pair, it is possible to recognize the complementary sequence on the Borrelia DNA among many, many forms, many molecules of other things. Uh, for instance, present in the plasma of the patient. So this would indicate there is some kind of uh, tuning, uh, resonance between some of the, pri the primers and some sequence of the uh, species of uh, DNA, the bacterial species of DNA. Next slide, please. Is it working? It's me. I forgot to mention that there is an important factor in this reaction is vortex. We have to shake very strongly, mechanically, the solution in order to transmit the, uh, the information to further dilutions. Next. Okay. And what we did is to assume that since there was an image, is that image already existing in the plasma of patients? And the answer is yes. So we can actually make a new type of PCR, which we, which we call quantic PCR, in which we don't see, we don't recognize the DNA molecule themselves, but the image in, in water in the plasma. Next slide, please. So we call those structures hydrions because they are made mostly of water so far. They are nanostructures, of course, about the size between 100 nanometers and 20 nanometers. And they seem to carry some DNA information of the Borrelia. We don't know yet if all the DNA, genomic DNA is transmitted in that way, but at least some genetic part are, especially the ribosomal, and it's possible, for instance, that since this uh, bacterium is intracellular, it could infect some organets, organella of, of the cells, especially the mitochondrial DNA, which is also bacterial origin, and perhaps uh, divert the synthesis of some proteins, bacterial proteins, instead of uh, mitochondrial proteins. So this, uh, of course, this is still an open question. We have not solved all the problems, but at least have a technique which is more sensitive, I will show you, than the classical PCR, and give a positive answer to patients which have been abandoned by the medical uh, environment. If, uh, of course, uh, there is uh, no uh, good serological test, no serologic test, no good uh, molecular test, the patient is considered not, not having any kind of 
Bolia infection, uh, which show that if instead we detect Bolia DNA fragments by this technology, we can prove the, the bacterium is still there. So we call that quantic PCR, and this could be applied not only to Borrelia, of course, but to other chronic diseases as well. So I like to detail the technique of the phase of the technique. So the first is to try to work on a very small amount of plasma DNA, of, of plasma for the patients. And if, even if we, we recognize the DNA, we don't do any DNA, DNA extraction. We work directly on the plasma, the total plasma. Of course, this plasma contains many proteins, enzymes, which can uh, inhibit the classical PCR, but after a few dilutions, uh, it's uh, sufficient, sufficiently pure uh, to make the reaction, the polymerase reaction without any problems. And we do some filtration, and for, for, again, vortex agitation at each dilution. And we do the PCR on each dilution. So this, of course, is more time consuming, uh, more expensive, but we use it when the classical DNA PCR is negative. And we can separate, like for the classical PCR, the DNA bands by rose gel electrophoresis, stained with fluorescent dye, eventually cloning of that DNA to make sure we are dealing with Borrelia DNA sequencing by the Sanger technique. So this is, of course, time consuming, and, but this is the only way when the patient had all the clinical symptoms or some clinical symptom of Lyme disease, but is negative by PCR and negative by serology. So uh, I, we made some hypothesis for explaining the fact that the, the PCR, when it's done to high dilutions, cannot recognize DNA because there is no DNA left. So we think at each dilution, there is some kind of reconstruction of the initial concentration of DNA or DNA images uh, after vortex agitation. And this may be like the formation of a liquid crystal uh, in uh, the solution. So this crystal would be, have the same, same dimension, magnification, at each dilution after the agitation, after the vortex. But uh, Dr. Vitello will give you probably more refined explanation of what I'm just saying now. Just an illustration of some electrophoretic gels we have seen, we have shown. You see in this gel on the left, the recognition of DNA and is at only two dilution, two and three in, in ten, uh, ten times dilution are visible, are active. But after that, we start at dilution eight to something which does not contain any DNA left, a calculation of the Avogadro number. But you can see in some of those high dilution, there is also a DNA band, and we check by, clo by cloning and sequencing that it was the same Borrelia DNA. And uh, we have stopped at uh, minus tw at uh, 20, D20, but uh, I'm sure uh, if we will continue, we will again have some bands in higher dilution. So this is important because it shows you an explanation of homeopathy. You can indeed dilute without diluting. We could have dilutions at the same concentration as at the beginning, but 
more pure, probably because they uh, remove the vermouth some impurities in, the, in that. But uh, again, this, uh, in this case, we have a transmission of the DNA ribosomal information by just uh, making high dilution with uh, shaking. And this is another example of a patient who was positive for a PCR, one dilution, but after that, nothing. And just at the higher dilutions, you can see the band, and a very strong band, indicating that there is complete maintenance of magnific with magnification of Borrelia ribosomal DNA in those dilutions. And this is the mother of the previous patient. And the mother was completely negative for any kind of uh, Borrelia DNA by classical PCR. Serology was, was negative. But uh, if we look at this quantic PCR, we see a lot of bands. I have to explain that you can see uh, all sort of negative dilutions, but we have shown that they are apparently negative, but they can also transmit the information because after two or more dilutions, they become positive again. So there is, uh, we know uh, real explanation yet, but this phenomenon has been seen also in many experiments with homeopathy. And some dilution become negative, but we, we have to explain why. Another case of um, patient. And so, uh, again, we use this technology only when the PCR classical PCR is negative, and when the symptom, the clinical symptom, tell that maybe the Lyme infection is there. I'd like to show this because this is very important. Uh, on the top of this uh, gel, you see again a patient which is uh, positive using uh, purified water from the laboratory. But if we use a thermal water, water coming from a spring, we see no bands in the amplification by dilution. Only the DNA itself could be seen, recognized by classical PCR, but also by this technology, it low dilutions, but nothing in high dilutions. And we have uh, started to explain this difference. Seems to be due to some components of the hot of the spring water. So it's possible in the future that we can suppress this formation of uh, of forms of water forms of Borrelia DNA just by exposing the patients to this uh, water. I'd like now to turn to a, another example of the application of this technology in a more complex disease in which several factors are involved. So uh, here I'm talking about autism, which we believe at the beginning is caused by the, an, a normal transmission of an infectious microbe. But there are also factors coming from uh, chemical herbicides like glyphosate. The aluminum we use as adjuvant in some vaccines. And perhaps also the electromagnetic frequencies which, to which the children are exposed. So we start this uh, study 
uh, in 2012, even a little before, based on the clinical observation of some of our clinician colleagues, indicating that antibiotic treatment could improve some of the autistic children. Not all, but some of them. And we have uh, founded a, a group of physicians which uh, uh, really has done that study and I exposed the results of this study in a meeting organized by Autism One, one of the uh, association taking care of the uh, autistic uh, children in uh, Chicago in 2012. At the same time, we had some evidence by measuring electromagnetic signals that those patients could be also infected by a microbe. But the most important work was done by Jan Lipkin and his associate at Columbia University in New York and published also in 2012. This was published in a, in a MBO uh, journal showing that by studying the gastrointestinal tract and making biopsies of the ileum of the infected, of the sick children, autistic children, they could detect a germ which was not recognized before, Suterella, in those biopsies and not in the control biopsy made in uh, children having the same problems in their gastrointestinal tract but were not autistic at all. So this uh, work was very important because we also use the same primers for ribosomal DNA, they have found for this bacterium, to look not only in the intestine but also in the blood. And this comes from the idea that now is well accepted that the first step in autism is the passage through the intestinal mucosa of some bacterial components. And this is, I think, shown right here. There is some passage from the gut to the blood and then also from the blood to the brain through the blood-brain barrier. This should be normally controlled in that way, but for some other reasons, for like other infection, it may be that the intestinal mucosa is partly open to the passage. And this uh, is probably the first step of a disease which now is impressive by the rapid increase of numbers since uh, uh, in the uh, United States there is one in 28 boys, less for the girls, which have this disease. So uh, this is really a, a public health problem, very important. And of course we have to, to see which factors can cause this increase of permeability of the intestinal mucosa. It's possible that it's uh, linked to the intensive, massive use of herbicides like glyphosate. And this slide shows some correlation, and not see causal, but some correlation between the increase of the consumption of glyphosate in corn and soy, in soy culture in thousands of tons in the United States and the increase of the number of children with autism. So this may be one factor which will modify not the, directly the microbiota of the children but maybe the microbiota of the animals uh, or the plants which are now modified by the intensive use of glyphosate. 
And so we study the situation for quantic PCR of children with autism. And the surprise was that, of course, we could find out uh, the same answer that the group of Lipkin had in the intestine, in the blood of those uh, children. But also, we found that many compounds used in uh, food, in animal nutrition, are also positive, and also many biological preparation. So it seemed that this DNA contamination, which was uh, due to several species, could be a new factor of chronic disease, including autism. We uh, sequence the DNA recognized by PCR using the Lipkin primers, and we could see that a group of bacteria was found in the high dilutions by PCR, and this group of bacteria belong mostly to uh, no other bacteria, which is the Bercolderial. It's difficult to pronounce, but it's probably due to one of the first uh, inventors of this, those species. But this would include many species, and we don't know it yet which species is important in pathology of, of those uh, children. But this is a clue, again, that also brought by the quantic PCR, that perhaps now we are contaminated, all the world is contaminated by this group of bacteria. For good or for bad, we don't know yet. But it's possible that those bacteria could play a role in, in disease, especially in neurodegenerative disease. So I will conclude this work, which is uh, which taken some time, but still preliminary, and uh, presentation by Professor Mitello will explain in more convincing de uh, de de details the importance of the quantum physics in that research. But I like to to tell you the message now that we should, uh, even this is the results are not what we expect. We have to take into account only the facts. The interpretation could change, but not the facts. And actually, if we don't, we don't include the facts which are against our previous theory, this is not real science. And this, of course, will have some impact on, on, on medicine. Med medicine should be based on reliable technology, more sensitive technology like the one we have described for prediction, prevention. But we have also to take into account the relationship between the doctor and his patients. And the, the treatment has to be adapted uh, more to the person, not to the disease. And we should uh, absolutely avoid any kind of iatrogenic medicine, disease and death caused by uh, medic medicine, by ignorance. And uh, that implies that we come back to the ethics of medicine, which is to have health prevailing on economy and not economy over health. And this implied that health could prevail on finance. I'd like to thank Dr. Lavallee, which has been the main researcher in this study, and Professor Vitiello for the conceptual part of this work, and my medical associate of Cronimen, in particular, 
Dr. Corinne Kopska, and my collaborator, Victor Nunez, my main collaborator, Suzanne McDonnell, and also here, thanks to Emilia Tzadeva. Thank you very much, and primum non motion. So I suggest if we have questions, they uh, should be uh, uh, done after the presentation by Professor Vitello. Professor Montagnier, and uh, so we have uh, plenty of time, but uh, um, uh, this, uh, uh, the second lecture will be combined with the first one, and I think that we'll have a lot of uh, time for questions if Professor Vitello will not take one hour. <laughs>